All right. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We have Thomas Getz. Thomas is a UC IPM affiliated advisor and a UC Cooperative Extension Weed Ecology and Cropping Systems Advisor serving Lassen County. And today he's going to be speaking on weed control in non-crop and natural areas with research highlights from the Intermountain region. And so now I'm gonna pass this over to Tom so you can go ahead and share your slides. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Tom Getz. I'm a weed ecology and cropping systems advisor in the Intermountain region of California. Um, so as all of you might not be familiar with uh, Lassen County, um, I cover uh, Lassen, Modoc, Sierra, and Plumas counties. I'm essentially in that northeastern corner of the state or the part of the state that borders Oregon and Nevada. Um, in the part of the state that I work in, uh, there's a lot of public land. Um, there's about 70% of the land is owned publicly. So there's a lot of opportunity for weeds to really get going in those non-crop and natural areas. And we really don't have a tremendous amount of people up here. So we have a lot of uh, you know, weeds that escape presences. And just wanted to give you that background for um, you know, where I'm coming from from this presentation. Um, getting going here, an outline of what I'm going to be um, talking about. Um, first, I'm going to talk about some definitions of weed management. And then I'm really going to get into talking about integrated pest management for weeds in natural areas. Um, talking about some of the things you need to do to identify weeds, um, how important early detection rapid response is, and a brief overview of some of the control um, options that you have for weeds, you know, through the pillars of I, an IPM system. Um, and then hopefully have some time to get into some research highlights. Hopefully I don't uh, talk too long and we can share a little bit of data. So defining weeds, you know, very, very simply, weeds are just a plant out of place, you know, and I would say that this is a very common definition of weeds, specifically when it comes to agriculture. Um, you know, any plant that's growing in the field that you don't want growing there is certainly considered a weed. If it's taking up space, it could be, um, you know, taken up by the desirable species. In terms of natural areas, those desirable species are typically species um, that are native to that ecosystem or, or native to California and are going to have, you know, benefits for um, wildlife. And then also, um, I do a lot of work with ranchers, so I think about livestock quite a bit. Invasive weeds, um, you know, when it comes to weeds in natural areas, there's a couple of different de definitions. Invasive weeds are weeds that generally are from another continent or plants from another continent that have come to North America and have the ability to fill an empty niche, really taking over um, certain areas and ecotypes, causing you know impacts on our environment as well as economic impacts. Um, Cal Ipsy is a great organization that I'll be or, uh, referencing a few times during this presentation, and they do a really good job of categorizing and quantifying different invasive weeds, um, you know, throughout California. And then there's noxious weeds. These are the weeds that your ag commissioner is coming after you for. So noxious weeds are legally required to be controlled. These are weeds that the state has determined um, are plants that are deemed to cause an environmental and economic harm to the state of California, specifically environment and agriculture. Um, noxious weeds are typically split up into three lists, A list, B list, and C list. Um, C-list species are weeds that are typically encouraged to be controlled. Um, they typically have very wide populations in California, and they know that we're never going to get rid of them. Where A-list species are species that still have a limited distribution in the state of California, and hopefully we'll be able to eradicate from the state, or at least that's the state's goal. Um, there are also some noxious weeds designated by the federal government. Um, that you know even go beyond those state regulations. But it's important to think about these different definitions of weeds because really, you know, the definitions of weeds, invasive weeds and noxious weeds in rangeland and natural areas, I mean, is a, a little bit different than you might think of it in an agronomic sense. And why are we worried about these plants? Well, we're worried about their ability to do this. So I know that there's a lot of biennial thistles that are invasive throughout California. Um, 
And this is one that we deal with up in my neck of the woods. This is Scotch thistle. It really has the ability to create monocultures displacing desirable plants, um, displacing, uh, you know, native plants and the types of animals and insects that rely upon those native plants and those native ecosystems. You know, this patch of scotch thistle, most of the plants are anywhere from five to seven feet tall. And it really, wildlife and livestock really just don't want to have anything to do with these sorts of uh, thistle patches. So this is what, you know, we're trying to avoid when we're talking about noxious weeds, is really trying to avoid them creating monocultures, taking over ecosystems, and transforming them into something that uh, is non-desirable. And of course, when dealing with any pest, I like to go at it through an integrated approach. Um, with an integrated approach, the first step of any integrated pest management program is to know what you're dealing with. Being able to identify that pest so that you can key in on the biology of that pest, understand the life cycle of the pest, and prevent reproduction um, when you can. So when it comes to weed management, it's really important to be able to identify them. That picture of scotch thistle that I showed a second ago, you know, we have about 10 or so invasive thistles in California, but we have about 50 native thistles in California, and you want to be able to differentiate between what's good and what's bad. In terms of different identification for weeds, um, there's a bunch of different tools out there. Um, you know, this is a, about the Bible in terms of books for weed identification. Um, Joe D. Tomaso's book, Weeds of California and Other Western States, a couple of volumes that are about um, a thousand pages each. Um, some people le learn really good from books. Um, personally, I learn plant identification very well from other people. Um, you know, learning from people in extension, learning from your ag biologists, learning from your PCAs and CCAs in terms of what the noxious weeds are. Um, can be a really good way to learn different plants. And then of course, there's other online resources that can be utilized. You know, websites like the UCI Center, um, there's a dichotomy key that Wisconsin has that goes through and helps you kind of identify some certain weeds. But more and more, um, well, wanted to give a, a shout out to Cal, I forgot I had this uh, slide in there. They have a bunch of great information about different invasive weed species and their identification. But I'd say more and more, I see people more interested in utilizing apps to identify weeds. So I just put a couple of symbols of some various apps up here that I have downloaded on my phone. Um, there's Plant Snap and Picture This, Google Lens, ID Weeds, um, different apps that allow you to take a picture of a weed and it'll spit out what it thinks it is. What I would say with these apps is that well, I think they're getting better and better with machine learning over time. And they're really good at putting you in the ballpark. Um, I wouldn't rely on them specifically only for weed control or weed identification. Um, it's important to double check some of the things that they spit out, but they really can be good ID tools, good ID tools to get you in the ballpark to go further on online resources or um, various paper resources. Once you know what you're dealing with, it's all about preventing reproduction, understanding the biology and life cycle of that weed so that you can keep it from reproducing. With annual weeds, um, there's winter annuals and there's summer annuals. You know, some of our common winter annuals like yellow star thistle and uh, cheat grass and medusa head. These are species that germinate in the fall and they really germinate all winter long. You know, many of the summer annuals you don't have to worry about targeting until uh, you know, the soil warms up and their germination cycle occurs. But it's important to know whether you're dealing with a winter or a summer annual so you can know when those plants are going to be small and you can know at when to go after them with various control methods. With annual weeds, it's important to know that there are, you know, some challenges. They really have long germination windows. So if you come in and you control an individual flush of an annual weed, you need to think that you're probably going to need to come back and control secondary flushes and third flushes, especially if we have good soil moisture. And it's also really important to think about annuals coming from seed. They only come from seed. They don't come from the roots. So in order to control an annual weed population, it's all about preventing them from producing seed. And they're very prolific seed producers. I don't have to tell anyone in the audience here, I'm sure, 
that weeds can produce a tremendous amount of seeds. You know, some plants might only produce a couple hundred seeds, where other mature plants might produce a couple hundred thousand seeds. So it's really important to keep those plants from flowering and going to seed so you can get on top of their populations. You know, this isn't just related to natural area weed management, but weed management in general. Because when those plants go to seed, those seeds go back into the soil seed bank. And that soil seed bank really cannot be overstated how important it is. Once you have a plant going to seed into the soil seed bank, it essentially starts your clock at zero. For some species like yellow star thistle um, or medusa head, those seeds might only last two to three years in the soil seed bank. So if you let one population go to seed, you're only gonna have to worry about controlling them for a couple of years. Where if you let other weeds go to seed like common mullein or scotch thistle that I mentioned earlier, those weeds can last, those weed seeds can last for decades in the soil, literally decades in the soil. So it's of utmost importance when you have a population of weeds, especially the just a couple of plants, keeping them from going to seed and keeping them from replenishing that seed bank is your number one way to go after annuals and biennials. The different with, difference with biennials, and we have a lot of noxious biennial weeds in our state, you know, the nap weeds and many of the, the thistles, Mediterranean sage. Um, these are plants that take two years in order to produce a flower and go to seed. So this gives you a secondary opportunity to control those plants. Ideally, you're controlling biennials when they're small and they're in that rosette stage. In that first year, in their rosette stage, they're relatively easy to control with physical methods as well as chemical methods. Most things work at controlling rosettes. Once those, once those plants have bolted and you have a big flowering stock on those plants, they become much more difficult to control with either physical or chemical methods. You know, some of the thistles that you might have to go at um, up in my neck of the woods, people have to go after them with axes because you'll literally have a stock on them that'll be five inches in diameter down at the base. Whereas if you get it when it's small, when it's a seedling, you can just kick it out of the ground with the toe of your boot. So annuals and biennials, it's all about preventing seeds. But we do have a lot of noxious weeds that are perennial. Perennial weeds being ones that are able to re produce reproductive tissue underneath the ground, whether it's roots, tubers, nutlets, corms, reproductive tissue that no matter what you do to the top growth, you're typically not gonna kill that tissue below the ground. Perennials in general are much more difficult to control and typically um, require multiple entries regardless what control technique you might be using. And they are prolific at producing that underground root material. Um, this is a picture I, I stole from my old advisor back at Colorado State. This is a Dr. Phil Westra. And I really like this slide because it demonstrates that underground reproductive capability of a perennial noxious weed, Canada thistle. What he did was he took a eight foot by four foot box, one foot wide and filled it full of soil. And then he took a cutting of Canada thistle root that was one foot long. And he put it in that box and just let it go for a year, watered it and saw what happened. And this is what happened. Hundreds of feet, literally hundreds of feet of Canada thistle root being produced by that one root fragment. And when you think about perennial weeds, Yes, you want to keep them from going to seed. You want to keep them from spreading. But if you have a patch of perennial weeds, this is really what you're trying to get at. You're really trying to get down to that reproductive plant material or that reproductive root material. And we have a lot of perennial weeds that are noxious, like perennial pepper weed that are up and down our state here in California. And then, of course, thinking about how those weed propagules move around. You know, how seeds move around and then also how roots move around. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do about wind dispersal, but there might be some things that you can do for noxious weeds, you know, with animals or moving equipment around the landscape. You know, moving equipment from one area to another area that's infested versus not infested could be a good way to move those noxious weeds um, in a natural ecosystem. So thinking about the things you can control and then also understanding the biology of the plant that you're dealing with and that you might just have to be, you know, watching for seedlings out there because they could be coming in on the wind or the water.
So now I want to shift gears and talk um, a bit more about active management in natural areas. So it's really important to think about where you're working in terms of what you're going to be able to utilize and what weeds might be there. So, you know, here's a, a picture of Eastern Lassen County. This is a um, high desert, probably only gets about 10 inches of precipitation a year. Um, it's supposed to be a, a perennial bunch grass ecosystem. It has a lot of invasive winter, winter annual grasses coming in that um, I'll, I'll talk about at the at the end of the presentation. But what grows here is going to be different than if you have an ecotype that is, let's say, in a riparian area, where you might have a whole different suite of types of plants that are able to come in and grow in that natural system where there is a lot more water. And what you're able to use in a grassland, you might not be able to use next to water, whether it's you know, physical control techniques that could have problems with erosion, you might not be able to get a mower into a riparian area, or you might have to use different herbicides to have an aquatic re um, registration. Likewise, what you can use in a forest is probably going to be different or could be different than what you use in those other areas. So it's important to know where you're working so that you can understand what weeds are going to be successful there and what weeds you need to take keep an eye out for in those different ecotypes. So I want to give a, a shout out to the, the cow weed mapper. Um, this is a real excellent tool to get you um, in the ballpark idea of what weeds you might need to be looking out for in a certain area. Um, this is a cow tool where you can come in and you can put in an eco region or you can put in a county um, or you can put in a species. But when you put in an eco region or a county, it allows you to download a report that will tell you what weeds you might be looking to surveillance for, what ones might have limited populations, and then what ones might be widespread. So if you're just coming into an area, you can get a ballpark idea of what some of the invasives are that you're going to be dealing with. They also do a really good job of if you think that you have a weed, um, showing you where that weed is going to be distributed throughout the state of California. Um, you know, these orange um, boxes have different meanings, whether the um, plant is expanding its range or contracting its range. And this can be a really good place um, to see where weeds might be growing. Another tool that I use all the time for identification, but then also to see if it's realistic that the weed is going to be growing in the area that I'm looking at is Calflora. Um, they have just about every plant on Calflora where it'll give you a nice map showing you where it'll be growing. It also has um, the Cal photos which is really good for identification where you can pull up a bunch of pictures from botanists that have submitted these photos so you can see what it kind of looks like, see what it might be. And then they also have this plant characteristics tabs that based on the botany records will tell you where that plant is going to grow in terms of general elevation, what sort of precipitation, um, those sorts of things that, so that you can narrow down and kind of think about where things are growing. So these are some things that I think are very useful um, especially when thinking about what weeds to be on the lookout for. Because when it comes to weed management in natural areas, it's all about early detection, rapid response. I'm sure that most of you have heard of this. And early detection, rapid response is the idea that you get a small population of weeds and you control them before they spread. So this can be at a statewide level when something's first coming in, this can be at a countywide level when something is first coming in, or this can be on your property. You might be on a property surrounded by a bunch of noxious weeds where your other adjacent landowners aren't doing their job. And being able to find those individual stems that are just coming up, this is when you wanna treat the weeds. When you just have a couple of stems, when you just have a single plant, that's when weeds are most easily controlled before they've set seed and you have that seed going back down into the seed bank. If you find a patch of weeds that's 10 acres large, you know, those, well, they do need to be controlled are much more difficult to control and take much more resources to control um, regardless where you're at, but specifically in natural areas where you might not be, you know, visiting the ground um, every single year. But this is what you want to avoid is, is big patches. If you can get them when they're small, um, it goes loads in terms of being able to um, keep them from developing the large monocultures that cause those problems that these invasive weeds do. In terms of what you can do from a cultural control side of things, 
really whatever you can do to limit um, seed distribution, you know, boot cleaning stations, um, preventing seed production when you can. Um, and then, you know, thinking about animals, how they might be moving things um, around the environment. And if you are planting things, as oftentimes in some of these degraded areas where you've done treatments for noxious weeds that were monocultures, you need to come back and you need to replant something so that you can get a desirable uh, vegetation established on site. Um, it's important to use seed that doesn't have any weeds in it. Um, you don't want to be planting seeds of weeds back in your uh, back in the area that you're trying to restore. And whatever you can do to limit disturbance. Um, this is a picture that I, I snapped a, a couple of days ago, and this is in the middle of the Dixie Fire just outside of uh, Lake Almanor. Um, weeds are ruderal species. They really have the ability to grow and thrive in areas that are disturbed. And when you have a large disturbance, such as a fire, or really any sort of disturbance, you can have a small population, a pocket of weeds, really explode upon the landscape. So the things that you can do to avoid disturbance and, you know, create a competitive environment for that system that you're working in, the less bare soil that you have, the less chance you have of a noxious weed really getting going and establishing. And where you do have disturbance, it's important to think about and target those areas. Hopefully your disturbance isn't large like the Dixie fire, which was nearly a million acres. Um, so that you can actually get out and cover ground and see where you might have weeds coming up and starting to gain their foothold in those areas of bare soil. So now um, talk about actually controlling weeds, what you can do to actively control weeds outside of that cultural um, side of things, which is very important. Um, I'd like to give a, a shout out to this tool um, in terms of talking about physical control for weeds. Um, this is a tool developed by UCIPM and the California Invasive Plant Council called Weed Cut. Um, it's an online decision support tool where you can enter in information about the weed, the type of area that that weed is growing, um, how thick the density of that weed is, and it will spit out different options for what sort of physical control techniques you might be able to utilize and how effective they might be. Because there's a lot of great physical techniques that can be utilized to control wildland weeds. And this is specifically focused towards that kind of non-crop group. So this weed control tool has, I think, a total of like 22 different techniques from a whole bunch of different cutting techniques, flaming, fire, grazing, tarping, hose, um, large equipment, small equipment, it has it all, and it has all these best management practices that really go through and give you information about each one of these techniques and how it can be used and what sort of plant it's going to be effective on. Generally, physical control techniques um, can be very effective, specifically when dealing with annual weeds, and they, they can be effective when dealing with perennial weeds in certain instances. Um, so I just lumped a few of these um, together and I'm gonna talk about them uh, briefly. You know, with cutting um, weeds, you know, this is just severing that uh, plant stem at the soil surface. You know, that can be done with a, with a knife, um, that can be done with a hoe, um, that can be very pretty effective to get good suppression and good control of annual weeds. Generally, when you're cutting annual weeds and that's your, your tool, you want to target that weed when it's in that bud early flower stage. That's when you want to go after them with cutting. Um, generally, depending on how much moisture is in the soil, um, you will get some re-sprouting and you might need to go in there and make a, a secondary cut or even a third cut if there's a lot of uh, moisture in the soil. Um, so, you know, you certainly can get control of certain um, annual weed species, and in other cases, you might get more suppression with cutting. But if you're persistent, it can be a very effective way to really get at some of those smaller populations. Um, you know, for a little bit larger populations, um, weed whackers, trim trimmers, brush cutters, you know, going through, that can be a good way to cover a lot more ground than you can with hand tools um, and be relatively selective still cutting some of the undesirable plants and not cutting the desirable plants. Because typically when you go to mowing, um, that's really when you have larger patches of weeds. And you're only going to be able to do it on certain types of soils and such. 
Um, that's one thing that really limits some um, large equipment mowers is how many rocks and such you have out on that rangeland. Um, but if you do have some flat area, mowing can be a, a good way to target some of those weeds, knowing that you're going to have to, you know, come back to those areas and that there can be some um, limitations with labor and uh, selectivity. Um, I'd say that one of the biggest ways that people target small patches of weeds um, that doesn't require any special equipment is just hand pulling. Um, there's nothing wrong with pulling annual plants. If you have three yellow star thistle plants, hand pulling them is a great way to get rid of them. If you have 100 acres of yellow star thistle, it can be much more difficult to go after it with a physical technique. But depending on your patch size, you know, physical removal can be a good way to go. Um, with larger trees and larger brush, oftentimes people will utilize large equipment to physically remove that material. And it can be an effective way if you get the majority of the roots and you don't have too much uh, re-sprouting. But anytime that you're utilizing large equipment um, for that sort of physical removal, or if you're using cultivation, um, you're going to create a lot of disturbance and you should think about what else might be coming in, but then also what you might need to replant. Um, one thing that, um, unlike uh, physical removal um, for perennial weeds, typically, um, you know, vegetative perennial weeds, you're not able to get all of those roots out of the ground with a physical removal. And so the one, uh, one technique that you can utilize for small patches um, of perennial weeds, if you just have a few stems, is tarping. Putting some tarp out there for two to three growing seasons, the non-selective technique, it'll kill everything underneath that tarp, but you typically can starve the root system if you leave that tarp on there and no light gets to the soil for a couple of years. But again, you're gonna create a bare patch and you're probably gonna need to, to reseed those areas. But it is one that I wanted to mention is it can be one of the physical techniques that is effective for a perennial weed species. And then biological controls. Um, grazing can be an excellent tool to control, or what I would say is opposed to control, really suppress larger populations of invasive weeds and keep their um, populations down, not necessarily eradicating them. I um, mean, that weed cut tool, there's a great chapter on grazing, and I'd also like to give a shout out to the University of Idaho Grazing Handbook that has specific recommendations for a lot of the weeds that we have in the Western United States in terms of what livestock what timing and what weeds can be suppressed effectively with grazing. I'm specifically looking oftentimes at the um, high intensity, um, short duration um, sorts of grazing practices. And then there's classical biocontrol. Classical biocontrol is this idea um, typically run by the USDA and some of our state programs in order to bring over insects and pathogens from that invasive species native range. So if the invasive species comes from Asia, they go over to Asia, they grab some of the things that might be um, effective at keeping it suppressed in its native range, undergoes a tremendous amount of testing before they're released into the states. And they're only released once they've been deemed to not have any negative impact on many of our um, natural uh, plants and animals. Um, they're, they're really selective in what they actually do choose to, to bring over. Um, and biocontrol is uh, really good for, you know, passive control. And in terms of the biological control um, organisms that are out there for noxious weeds on um, in natural areas, again, there's a great chapter in that weed cut best, can, uh, best management practice guide um, that delves into each one of those, as well as a lot of good information on our UCIPM um, website that will tell you about the different biocontrol um, um, organisms that can be utilized. In terms of some of the things that I've been doing with biocontrol, um, I've been working with uh, Mike Picarian and Viola um, Papascu with the CDFA. Um, one of the projects that I've been helping them out with is looking at Russian knapweed gall wasp and seeing if we could get um, it established here in California. Um, this is a wasp that will feed I and mean, create galls on the, on the stem of Russian knapweed plants. So this is one of the plants that I pulled out of the ground about uh, two weeks ago, um, where we've been able to establish uh, multiple populations up here in Northeastern California, um, hopefully some nursery sites before we uh, spread them around. Um, another material that I'm pretty excited um, about, but have had limited success so far, 
is uh, Punicea punctiformis, or the Canada thistle rust. Um, stole a couple of slides from the Department of Agriculture back in Colorado, um, where this work started, where they took this rust and they inoculated thistle plants um, in order to see if they could get control of the root system. Um, here's one of their slides where um, they were able to inoculate this patch of thistle in 2014. And after that root system was infested about three years later, they reduced that thistle patch and there wasn't any other thistle growing out there. Um, this is real exciting stuff because the majority of bio can, or the majority of um, biocontrols don't actually eliminate the, the host plant. And for something like Canada thistle that has that deep root system that's really hard to control with anything but herbicides, um, this is real exciting. Um, we've made a bunch of releases here in uh, California over the past three years, but unfortunately, um, rust and dry winters ha hasn't really played out too well um, with the release sites that I've had over in Lassen County or the release sites that have been up in Siskiyou County. Um, but my uh, colleague Jeff Stackhouse has had some um, luck getting those populations established on, on the coast. So, so we're hoping that we'll have a, a good nursery population and can see some exciting things over there in the in the coming years. Um, herbicides are what I'm going to talk about next, um, which is chemical control methods. Um, there's a whole bunch of different herbicides out there for controlling um, plants. You know, we have a, you know, right around 30 modes of action looking at the um, herbicide resistance action committee um, herbicide classification system. And with herbicides um, in natural areas, I think it's really important um, to think about timing of the weed and the desirable plant. When it comes to herbicide applications, generally annuals are going to be most susceptible when they're young and small. When they're in that seedling growth stage, when they're small, that's when you're going to be able to really hammer them with herbicides. Just like that's the growth stage that you're really going to be able to get after them successfully with physical control techniques, things are just easier to control when they're young and small. Biennials, as I mentioned before, easiest to control when they're in that rosette growth stage. When it comes to perennials with herbicides, um, they're often easiestly controlled when they're in the bud stage, after they've grown up and they've used a lot of their carbohydrate resources to stress that root system, draw some of the sugars out of that root system, and they have a lot of foliage up top where you can spray that foliage and get good absorption down back into the root. Or with many species, you know, like Russian knapweed, um, you can get really good control of those perennial weeds with a fall application um, where you can get that herbicide to move down into the root um, with those sugars that are moving down into the root from the foliage as it starts to shed its above ground growth. And then for pre-emergent herbicides, um, I don't need to tell anybody in this audience, I'm sure you want to put those out before you have rain so that you can actually get them incorporated into the soil so that you can get good seed activity. In terms of our natural area herbicides, uh, most of the ones that we deal with are not contact herbicides unless you're looking at organic products. Um, organic products like, you know, your oils and vinegar, um, they can be good to burn the top off of a plant that's established. And you can get good control of plants with those contact herbicides where the herbicide doesn't move. It's just going to burn what it touches. Um, they work well on, on seedlings. Most of our wildland herbicides are systemic. Um, these are products like glyphosate and aminopyrrolid and 2,4-D, um, copyrrolid, triclopyr. And these are herbicides that will be absorbed by the plant and moved down into the roots so that you can get control of larger weeds, even though they work just as well on small annual weeds, and get control of perennial weeds, really trying to get after that root system. And then another aspect to think about with herbicides and specifically for wildlands, well, not specifically for wildlands, but how they act in the soil. Um, we have different herbicides that are pre-emergent only. These are herbicides that you're gonna be able to put out and create a blanket on the soil surface that are gonna prevent seeds from germinating through them. And these are things like dithopyr and, and dazaflam, really targeting that seed growth stage and potentially leaving some of those desirable perennials back. Many of our um, herbicides that are highly effective and often utilized in rangelands and wildlands are products that have both pre-emergent activity as well as foliar activity. Aminopyrrolid, chlorosulfuron, clopyrrolid. These are herbicides that you can get good control of that top growth 
but then also leave a residue on the soil surface to prevent those seeds from germinating. One of the things that I think about when you're utilizing products that have both tree and foliar activity is that if you have a patch of weeds, it's important to treat not just the stems of those weeds, but the soil around the stems of those weeds so that you can prevent that seed bank from really getting going. Because if you're utilizing things like glyphosate or dicamba that don't really have a lot of residual activity, they can give you good control of the top growth. They're systemic and they'll give you good control of the root, but you're gonna have to worry about the seeds that are in the soil surface. These no residual herbicides really do have their place. They can be you know, applied very selectively and they're very good for areas that you need to come through and you need to reseed. Another way to alter selectivity besides just the innate properties of the chemistry, you know, whether it's gonna be safe on grasses or whether it's gonna be safe on broadleafs is the application method. Um, I'd say that the largest way that people treat weeds in natural areas, um, specifically when they're doing that early detection rapid response is with spot treatments. You know, just going out there with a backpack and hitting those individual stems can be a great way from keeping those plants from really blowing up. Um, in areas where you have, you know, real sensitive species and you need to make a directed application, wick applicators can be a really good way to um, make that application and just rub it right on the plant. Again, for small populations. For larger populations, you're probably going to get into some broadcast applications, whether it's with a UTV, um, a tractor, or um, there are many instances where aerial applications do have um, effectiveness. And then for woody you know, treatments, um, cut stump and basal bark treatments are, are often commonly used for many of our woody invasives. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Joe Tommaso and Guy Kaiser's book, Weed Control in Natural Areas in the Western United States, that you can get at the UCM IPM, UCIPM website. Um, this is a, a tremendous amount of um, information that will give you specific um, strategies and tactics that will work by weed. It talks about physical, chemical, cultural controls, but then it also gives you all of the different herbicides that have activity on that plant, as well as um, the rates that can be utilized, as well as some tips and techniques. And if you want to get an idea of what it looks like inside the book, um, Google your favorite weed and put weed report by the end of it, and you might be able to pull up the page and, and get a taste. But it's a really important and valuable resource. And then, of course, when utilizing um, surfactant or um, herbicides, it's important to use the right surfactant or adjuvant, um, specifically when you're dealing with uh, drought stress plants and plants that have hairy leaves. You know, adding that little bit of extra non-ionic surfactant or methylated seed oil to the tank can really help with your control. Um, herbicides are really one of the best ways to target perennial weeds. And based on the properties of the herbicide, as well as how you apply it, you can get good selectivity and leave some of those desirable species on site and not injure the plants that you're trying to protect from being taken over um, by the weeds. And of course, um, often it does come down um, to economics. You know, how much is it going to cost to spray one year versus going and doing multiple mowing applications for a couple of years? So let me see how much time I have before we get into um, some potential updates. Um, this is one trial that I just wanted to talk about briefly. Um, a, a scotch thistle trial that I think should be relatable to many of those that are dealing with um, invasive thistles and dealing with invasive biennial thistles, which are up and down our state. Um, I wanted to look at fall versus spring applications as most of the um, studies that I could find on scotch thistle looked at spring applications, they weren't looking at that fall application to the rosettes. They were looking at, you know, spring applications. And I wanted to test method or aminocyclopyrochlor. Um, method is a really active herbicide on broadleaf plants. Um, you can get some cool season grass injury, um, but it is a real good burn down um, product that has a really long residual activity. And I wanted to see if we could get extended control in the seed bank and found some um, relatively interesting things. So. Um, made some applications. I'm just going to talk about the fall applications, but made some applications to small research plots um, in October um, to relatively small um, rosettes and then uh, assess control and species cover. 
Um, generally, when I like to think about weed control in natural areas, it's not like agriculture while I'm worried about controlling it in the first couple of weeks. I want to know what comes back the next year and even in the year after that. So in terms of uh, milestone or aminopyrrolid, Grazon Next, Telar, and then all those different method applications, most of them look, looked really good 12 months after treatment. 24 months after treatment, we started to get quite a bit more scotch thistle coming back in, where we were still getting pretty good control with Telar, and then good control with method plus um, Esplanade or Endazoflam. Um, in terms of what we were doing to the plant communities out there, really what I want you to focus on here is the pink bars. That's scotch thistle, where Telar and um, Method Plus Esplanade had really small bars. And then most of these bars were quite a bit smaller than the untreated, but we did have some thistle growing out there. And then also these annual grasses, um, where many of our treatments where we controlled the thistle, we released the annual grasses, except where we included this um, Esplanade and Dazzleflam in the tank. So here's a picture. Check this didn't get any beside. Nice forest of eight foot tall Scotch thistle. Um, here's milestone. Um, looking not bad, but we still had some plants here that were going to go to seed that would have needed to be retreated. Um, 21 months after application. And then this is a, one of the Tellar treatments, looking pretty good. But we released the annual grasses and. You know, that wasn't necessarily desirable in this case, is they're also an invasive. Um, and then here's a, a picture of that method plus um, in Dazaflam, where we got good control of the scotch thistle with the method, and we got good control of the um, annual grasses with the Dazaflam, and we released this perennial western wheatgrass. And we would have loved to see this across the site, but the one thing that I would say with um, the Dazaflam is that if you use it, um, you also have the potential to release whatever undesirable plants are there. So in another one of our plots, we released a short white top or hoary crest. So it's important to think about, you know, when you're utilizing some of these tools, also what you're going to shift that ecotype to or what you're going to shift that, uh, that system to, because you certainly don't want to just go from one weed um, to the next. And I, I'll just talk uh, briefly. I think I got a couple of minutes. I'll try to leave five minutes for questions um, about some of the invasive annual grass control that I've been doing. Um, going back to that uh, Indazoflam application, there have been problems with fire and invasive annual grasses um, throughout California and specifically in the, in the Intermountain region. And I've been doing a lot of work um, is with in Dazaflam, because while we do have tools for invasive annual grasses, the ones that we do have often will only give us a single year of control, where it'd be great if we could get multiple years of control after a single application. Um, so this product in Dazaflam, um, I, I showed it as Esplanade before. This is the non-crop um, version of it. Um, it was just recently re registered for grazing as Rejuvra. And then those for those PCAs, this is the same product as Allion in grapes. Um, you know, it's that, that tree and vine herbicide. That's why it came to California. And that's why, we, you know, it's spilling over also into some of these other areas. And it's real exciting where you can take an area like this where I had a trial a few years ago. And, you know, with a single application, 31 months after treatment, still getting really good control with that Indazoflam application. The scary thing about this though is that we don't have a whole lot else growing on the site. So also really scary from a land manager thing. If you don't have any perennials, I'd really stay away from uh, stay away from this product. But if you have um, perennials, um, it can be something to think about. Had a, a couple of different trials. Um, looking at sequential applications, but I just wanted to show a couple of pictures from the Clear Lake National Wildlife Refuge where they have uh, some sage grouse habitat, um, where they've done a fire break. Um, and this is what it looked like before the fire break. Um, came in with an application of indazoflam plus room sulfuron, and they were able to see it from the aerial imagery getting good um, annual grass control, which will hopefully prevent any fires from getting into that, that sagebrush ecosystem. And this is what it's like on the ground, releasing a bunch of perennials and killing those invasive winter annual grasses in a pretty stark difference and pretty exciting stuff that um, we're continuing, that we're monitoring um, over the next couple of years to see what the impacts are from untreated versus, you know, what desirable perennials are um, taking those applications relatively well um, versus what ones we might be controlling or killing. <laughs> 
Um, and with that, I'll, I'll take any questions if I if I have time. Yeah, there's a couple minutes. Um, there's just one comment in the chat. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but there was just one comment that came in um, that says there seems to be a lot of different ways the label will talk about WIC applications, and this makes it confusing to apply using this technique. Yes, I 100% I agree um, with the WIC applications. They certainly are not always clear um, on the label. Um, the materials that really I'm most familiar with people utilizing WIC applications are, are mainly focused around um, utilizing glyphosate um, with a WIC applicator. Um, you know, sometimes some of the synthetic auxins, um, but yeah, label language is often unclear. And I wish I, uh, if you had a specific label, I'd certainly have no problem taking a, a look at it with you. Okay, and then there's a question that just came in. What would you recommend to control nutgrass? Um, by nutgrass, I'm assuming that you're talking about uh, yellow nut sedge. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I, I guess it would depend on where that nutgrass was uh, growing. Um, but one of the things that has the most activity to it just as a purely herbicide um, side of things would be a uh, hollow sulfuron. Um, is a good material for for nut grass, but I don't know if it would be labeled specifically where you're where you have it. And then just another one. Um, oh, that was yes, that one said certainly for nut sedge. And then th another question was any information on yellow nut sedge control in strawberries? Um, you know that's a good question. I I don't work in strawberries, so I certainly could not could not speak to that. But it's something that uh, I'm sure I could talk to some of my colleagues and potentially come up with some answers, but in all honesty, off the top of my head, that, that's probably a pretty difficult situation. Okay, I think that's all. Oh, let's see. There are uh, there one in the chat, and then we'll go ahead and put the link to the final test. But um, one was, do you deal with wild hedge parsley? Any recommendations for pre-emergent control? Um, I don't deal with wild hedge parsley. Um, it, it's not one that grows grows in my um, in my area, unfortunately. Um, thank you all for hanging in there and um, we hope to see you at our next one. Thank you again, Tom, for your presentation. No problem, thanks for having me. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your day.